Good morning, North Elliott. It's good to see you this morning. Let's stand and worship together. I was buried beneath my shame. And who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met you. And I was breathing, but not alive. good this morning. Who's excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen, amen. If you would, would you just greet somebody this morning that maybe you haven't yet today? Go find them this morning. Awesome. As you find your way back to your seats this morning, you may be seated for just a moment. I'll allow you to sit today. I know me and Pastor give each other a hard time about sitting and not sitting, but it's all just out of fun. But uh, I wanted to say thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, if you are a visitor this morning or uh, somebody that's just come a few times, we want to say thank you for joining us this morning. We don't take that lightly. Thank you for being here. I know we had a couple young ladies I haven't seen in a while, and the, 
the Youth Sunday School, so we were excited for that. Can we just give it up for our first-time guests or guests that haven't been back in a while? Amen. We've got just a couple of announcements this morning. First, we wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you for the candy donations that you have given us um, for our Easter egg hunt. Um, we are so blessed. If you still did have donations, though, you can still turn them in in the lobby in that box out there. But you guys have went above and beyond, but we will definitely take more donations. Um, but with that being said, I want to remind you that this Wednesday night, it's not going to be a normal night. We are having our prep night for Palm Sunday. So if you come that night, we would love to have you, but it's going to be setting up, practicing, um, just really preparing our church for visitors that will be coming next Sunday morning for our Palm Sunday celebration. And we are excited for that. Um, our, our little ones back in the back have been working super, super hard getting ready for next Sunday morning. They're excited to lead us next week in worship. And I know also our youth have been practicing. We may have snuck a couple up here today. He's doing an awesome job this morning. Um, but we've got um, them helping lead us in worship next week as well. Um, but we've got so much going on next weekend. There's going to be a free meal over in the, the fellowship building now, not the Air Force anymore, the fellowship building. Um, but we would love for you to invite your family, invite your friends. It's going to be an amazing day. Our young people are helping lead us. But we are going to have an amazing time also with Pastor JR and the Hispanic Church helping lead that service as well. We just want you here. We want to fellowship that day, and it's going to be awesome. But also that following week, we have our Good Friday service. It'll start at 6 p.m. We're going to have worship and communion. We would love for you to be there that night. Um, we're going to do a little bit of a, an acoustic set, I believe, and it'll be great. We would love for you to join us. And then also that Sunday morning, we will be having an Easter breakfast beforehand. So Sunday school will be taking place as a breakfast with everyone coming together. We would love for you to join us that morning. And also, we really wanted to have an Easter service where the gospel is preached. That's kind of the heart behind doing Palm Sunday first and then doing our normal Easter because we know that Easter is one of the, the, the craziest, busiest days for people to come to church. And we didn't want to slim it down or for people not to hear the true gospel. We wanted them to come in and our pastor to get the opportunity to preach and for people to seriously experience the power of God, to seriously experience a message that is leading them to the cross and to that empty tomb. So we really, we would love for you to invite people that day. You know, I've, I've been looking and I've been, I've been preaching a, a series over in the, the youth building on Wednesday nights. And in that research, you know, still the number one people, the number one way people come to church. It's not through a billboard. It's not through a Facebook post. It's through you and your word of mouth inviting them. So I'm, I'm challenging myself, but I also want to challenge you. Let's invite people this Easter season. Let's invite them. Let's be friendly. Let's be the church and go out of our way. Even if it's someone you have never met before, invite them to church because all it takes is one person getting invited, and it could mean their children, their family, generation after generation could find themselves chasing after Jesus because you simply said, hey, would you like to come to my church this Sunday? How powerful is that? But with that being said this morning, we'll get ready to take up the offering. I don't believe I've missed anything, but if I did, I'm sure we will, we will cover it before the end of service. But if you would, all over the room, stand with me as we can get ready to continue into worship this morning. Once again, thank you for being here. And I'll go ahead and pray. Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for this time we get to gather together in your house. I thank you for this opportunity, this chance to come in here and worship you. God, as we get ready to prepare for all of this, the Easter services, the, the fun that we'll have, the, the time we'll get to look back and remember what you've done for us, Lord. Father, I pray we don't find ourselves looking so far ahead we forget to worship you this morning. God, let our focus this morning be on you. Let our focus be on worshiping you. Let our focus be on giving back 
to you. Lord, I thank you. I praise you. I ask that you touch the service, anoint our pastor to bring a word that is from you, from your throne room this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.
anything, that there is nothing that is too impossible, there is nothing that is too hard for our God, and we believe that with everything. This next song, it's a newer song, but it has stuck with me so much. It's by Charity Gale, and when she came about a year and a half ago, she sang this song, and this line that she said, it has stuck with me. She said, in the field of doubt, plant a seed of faith, and God will send the rain. How many of you are believing for something? Maybe it's something that you've been praying for for a long time, and maybe you feel like giving up. But like this song said, that we are believing for it, that there is nothing that is too impossible for God. So today, it, you have made, you, maybe you've been praying for this for a long time. Maybe it's been years. Maybe it's been months. It's been weeks. Maybe you just found something out this past week and you are believing God for a miracle. Well, wherever it looks like you should be doubting, you say, no, I am going to have faith because God can do it. And he will send the rain and he will water that field of doubt and he will turn it into a beautiful garden. So believe that today with me as we sing this next song. Let's just go ahead and close our eyes and lift our hands and let's just begin to welcome God into this place. Let's just begin to welcome his presence in here because where he is, there is nothing that is too impossible for him. There is nothing, no situation, no circumstance that he can't fix, he can't heal. All those broken pieces. God can pick them up and make something completely new and beautiful. So God, today, Lord, wherever it looks like doubt, God, we are, we are planting our seed of faith, God, because you can do anything, Lord. God, you are so powerful. There is power in your name, God. There is so much power in your name. There is life in your name, God. There is healing in your name, Lord. And we are so grateful, God, that we get to just sit in your presence, Lord. I know, God, that I have taken this moment for granted, God, where I don't truly understand who I am worshiping, God. But today, Lord, we put all of our faith and our trust in you, God, and we know that you can do anything, God. We are believing that this morning, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' mighty and holy name. Amen.
Just love on Jesus for a few minutes. Let's just take two or three minutes and let's just love on Jesus. You'll be glad. You'll be glad that you did. Hallelujah. You'll be glad that you did. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, Jesus. It's all about you. You're the center. You're the circumference. You're the inside. You're the outside. You are above. You are beneath. You are all around. You're the center of our focus, the center of our worship, the centerpiece of this service. May we lift you that all may see you and know you as we know you. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to give much uh, props and thanks. Uh, Pastor Cammie did a wonderful job today. Um, Her and Pastor Austin are in the MIP, which is the Ministerial Internship Program, and studying and taking that nine-month course, and she doesn't get anything out of it other than a grade. Uh, Pastor Austin will be positioned to go take his ordination test, but uh, she was tasked today to deal with spring break sicknesses and people's schedules, and so she put this, uh, this team together. Would you give her a hand for that? Amen. Hallelujah. So thankful that Remnant could be with us and kind of fill in the gap. They've been, uh, uh, they've begun, I shouldn't say they've been, they've begun helping our worship team across the street, uh, Dawn and Charissa 
and Mark and them, they have a proven method for raising up young people to play instruments and to lead in worship. And so they've partnered with us in this season. And it's my hope that whenever Pastor Austin, Pastor Cammie, one of them preaches again in the summer, that they can have the whole youth praise team, drums, bass, keys, and all of that can be here so you can see uh, how wonderful God is. I forgot the guitar, Lily. I'm sorry. I just saw your face. I apologize. If it was sitting there, I would remember to say it. But we're going to fill this this stage with young people. Let's give it up for Drew. The, the soul, any youth um, representative today, but we will, have, we will have many, many others. And I'm just excited about all that God is doing in this season in the adults and in our youth and in our kids. And next week, you're going to get to see a piece of that. You'll get to see some of that because the youth will be leading us a little bit. The kids will be leading us, doing a couple performances. You'll get to see what Pastor Twile and Pastor Sky are doing back there in the hallway with your kids and grandkids. And then, of course, we always love it when we get to have an opportunity twice a year to have the joint service with the Hispanic Church of God. Our relationship with them and partnership with them goes way back many, many years. And it was even brought up about the uh, the fifth Sunday worship nights came up, something that Pastor David and Pastor Reuben have both mentioned in the past. So who knows, maybe we'll do some some of those and we'll, 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 uh, we'll sing in Spanish and we'll sing with the understanding. We'll sing in the spirit, we'll sing with the understanding, right? So we'll, we'll get all that done. But uh, our focus this particular um, Easter season has been on the souls of people. And what began as a question in my mind of why did Jesus come I began to explore that around Passover. And I've been talking to you about Nicodemus who came to Jesus at night, right? Nicodemus came at night and he asked the light what what it, what it is. What did what is this that you're doing? What is this you're talking about? What is this new way that you're bringing? And it happened around Passover and then last week we talk about Zacchaeus, this wee little man, you know, I learned that song in, in uh, vacation Bible school. You, do, you, do you know it? I'm not going to sing it. I'm just asking, do you know it? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he, right? I, I didn't sing at all. I just sung part of it, right? Let's see the hands again. Thank you to my generation. Hallelujah. I bless you. And those of you that are younger that, that endured that, that song, um, we learned that one and that the devil needs to sit on attack. We learned that one, too. I won't sing that one. <laughs> Woo, I'm feeling witness in the house, getting some amens already. But what, what was Jesus doing around Passover? What, what was happening? And so I've been asking, asking that question the last couple of weeks, right? Why did Jesus come? And so here's, here's kind of in a nutshell. Jesus came to save the world, not condemn the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, right? But that through him they might be saved. And then from Zacchaeus we learn that he was a son of Abraham. And why shouldn't Jesus come to seek and to save that which was lost? And, of course, I use different uh, additional material out of Luke 15 as well about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And then we kind of ended last week talking about Jesus came to serve. His disciples were kind of lost in this conversation in, in Matthew 20 about uh, who would be great among them? And, and Jesus pointed the way that he did not come to be served, but to give his life 
as a ransom for many. So that's what I've been asking myself, and that's what I've been asking us as a church. Why did Jesus come? But today we're going to shift that, that focus. We're going to shift that focus, and we're going to ask, what should our response be to the gift of his salvation? If Jesus came to save, that's basically what these three ideas are about. If Jesus came to save, this idea of soterra in the Latin or sozo in the Greek. If Jesus came to save us, to redeem us, to pay the price for us, a ransom, we were kidnapped by sin, if you will. And someone had to pay the price. And so he came to be that price because of God's love. And so if that's where it is, right, what should our response be to his gift of salvation? And for me, the best response I found in the Bible is Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. For Mary, that response was faith, extravagance, and sacrifice. We're going to read it in the text here in a moment, but I want you to see these three things. Mary believed completely that Jesus was the Son of God, or she would have never worshipped Him. She loved extravagantly, or she never would have done what she did. The culture of the setting of John 12 and Mark 14 that we're going to look at, and it's also in Matthew 26, but we're just looking at John and Mark. Women, women were not allowed. I know the chosen and other things show you a different picture. Not that women weren't valued. They just weren't at the table. They were in the room but they weren't at the table. And so Mary also worshiped sacrificially because she broke something over Jesus that was valuable. I wanted you to see those three things before we got into the text. So this is six days before Passover. What does that say to you? This is six days before Jesus dies. He is the Passover lamb. He's the ransom. He's the price. And at Passover time, six days prior, the lamb was set aside that was to be sacrificed. This event does a wonderful thing. Jesus will tell us, and I'll, and I'll really dig into it later, but this act was the setting aside of Jesus as the sacrifice. And he came to Bethany. He comes to Bethany. And he's there in the house where Lazarus was. The one who had been dead. Whom he had raised from the dead. They, they're making sure we understand this. Mark and Matthew tell us the house was the house of Simon. Simon, who Jesus healed of leprosy, was the host. Now, the commentators are mixed. Could Simon be Martha's husband? Could Simon be the father of Lazarus, Martha, and Mary? We don't know. What we do know is that there was a gathering and probably an idea of a celebration for Jesus who had both healed Simon and raised Lazarus from the dead. Isn't this a wonderful picture of salvation? He raises us from the dead, for we were dead in trespasses and sin. Or he 
heals us of our sickness, one of our sicknesses being our sin, for he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And there they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard. So this nard, this plant, comes from northern India. It had to be imported. It was very costly, and it was red in nature. And it was mixed with olive oil. And so I want you to see this, this pound of very costly oil oil of spikenard, and she anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. So just hold right there for a moment. Now I want you to go home today, and I want you to get out your measuring cup, and I want you to fill that measuring cup with 12 to 16 ounces of water or fluid so you can get a picture of what this looks like, right? So water's just going to run over quickly, but oil is going to stick, and the color is going to stain. So Jesus is being set aside as the sacrificial lamb. This is a pound of oil, and she breaks it. She breaks it, Mark and Matthew tell us. She broke the box. Now, in this Middle Eastern culture, when something has been given of value to somebody who has the highest worth, the container in which that substance comes from is broken because no one else would ever be worthy enough to use that vessel again. This vessel was never going to be refilled with the same substance. It was to be broken over Jesus because he is of the highest value. He's the highest person. Yes, he was the honored guest at the supper, but he was the one who was the most deserving. So I want us to see that. I want us to feel that moment. I want us to sense the the weight of what is going on as she's breaking this oil and pouring it over him and pouring it on his feet and wiping his feet with her hair. I want you to see this. I want you to even smell the fragrance. If you want to get a little taste of it, come come around after service and open up one of these bottles of anointing oil and get a smell. And that's just a hint of what this room must have smelled like. The fragrance of the sacrifice lingering, even going back to the Old Testament times. The fragrance of the charred animal, the fragrance of of, of the sacrifice going up before God. The fragrance of the priest with the incense and the censer going into the holy place and sprinkling the blood on the Ark of the Covenant, on the mercy seat, asking for his own forgiveness and the forgiveness of his people. This is Jesus, our great high priest. These are all images and pictures I want you to gather in your mind. But not everyone was happy. In verse 4 it says, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son. Now, I doubt this is the same Simon that they're in his home. But he's Simon's son who would betray him said. Now, I want to tell you something about John, the gospel writer. John, the revelator. uh, John, the elder. However you want to refer to him. I love John. John says, don't like Judas. He tells us from the beginning, don't like this guy. He, he, he doesn't want anyone to get attached to Judas. Although Judas is one of the twelve, Judas was never one of the twelve. He was counted in the number, but he was not one because Jesus said, I have kept those 
that you have given me. But the one I could not keep is the one who was never mine. And Judas was never his. And so Judas, the one who would betray him, says, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now in the Hebrew calendar, there are 354 days. A denarii is a day's wage. So 300 days worth of money was just poured on Jesus' head and feet and being wiped off. And he couldn't even smell it. Right? He couldn't even smell it because all he could think of is how else it could have been given. Right? But then John, remember, John doesn't want us to like this guy, so he says, this he said not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. He skimmed it. He was skimming the money box. Just a little bit for the rainy day fund. Now let's take a shift. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Now let's jump to what Mark does. Mark wants to make sure we get the second piece. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, this woman who has done, right, this woman has done what, excuse me, what this woman has done, I'll get it, what this woman has done will be told as a memorial to her. Then Judas, one of the twelve, went out to the chief priests to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad, and they promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. Did you realize that the final straw that broke Judas's back was an act of extravagant worship. Judas was already having doubts about what Jesus come to do, but this moment is what sent him off the cliff. And he sought for a way to betray him because Matthew tells us that the chief priests had been plotting. They had put a price on Jesus' head Somehow Judas had learned about this price. And he determined to sell him out. I want us to take a moment and pray again before we dig deeper. Father, take these verses that we have heard and this commentary that has been given and drive home the point you want to make to the congregation in this room and to those who are watching us in hospital rooms and living rooms. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Let's dig into the three characters, the primary players of this story. First, Mary, the worshiper. The manner of her worship was extravagant and costly. Let me move quickly through a couple of things that I have not mentioned yet. Mary broke every form of religious etiquette when she entered the room and broke the box of spikenard over Jesus and anointed him. Not only was she there, but she was there and she was worshiping Jesus and she was touching Jesus. She broke every form of religious etiquette, every form of cultural etiquette. And you know what? She didn't care. She did not care because Mary not only offered her precious treasure, a gift 
worth 300 days of work. But she also offered her personal glory. For in the Bible days, the women's hair were their glory. It was their glory. A woman's hair was her glory. She took her glory, her personal glory. Not just the most precious thing she had. I mean, she sold out in this moment. Because she realized something before Jesus ever said it. There will be other moments when we will eat. But there will not be another moment when Jesus is here. Like he is now, the way it is now. According to the handfuls on purpose, the religious will never know the level of worship that Mary poured out because they are content to offer to the Lord lame lambs and blind circumstances. I mean, excuse me, blind sacrifices. Blind sacrifices. Did you know in Jesus' day why he turned over the table of the money changers and why he released the sheep and the doves? You've made my father's house a house of merchandise, yes. But it was because they were selling the lamb as a sacrifice. They were taking it around the side and bringing it back in and selling it again and never sacrificing it. They were taking people's money, and they said, oh, your currency is no good here. You have to have temple money, and the temple money had an exchange rate, so they were extorting from the people. The people couldn't purely worship because the system had polluted the way to worship, and Jesus had to fix it, but Mary knew this somehow in her spirit. She wasn't religious. She had no pretense. She just comes and gives to the Lord in the moment that thing that she holds most dear, her bottle of spikenard and her glory. But the religious, they will never see to cross over the threshold of this type of self-sacrificing worship. Because of that, they never know a fragrance and an odor that fills the room that goes beyond anything that was given. Next, we want to look at Judas, the criticizer. Critics are not happy unless they get other people to become critical with them. Judas did not appreciate the manner of her worship. He thought it was extravagant. He thought it was too costly. And her worship was wasted on him. All he could think of is how the money could have been used some other way. I want you to think about that. He begins to look around the room. And Mark and Matthew say the other disciples fell in with him. They too began to criticize. They too began to say, to what purpose is this waste? Listen to me. Where a spirit of pride is where a spirit of self-seeking is, where a spirit of hypocrisy is, and etc. There is also blindness to the moments that we have to worship and honor our Lord Jesus Christ. What was the waste? What was the purpose? To Judas, the sweet odor of the ointment smelled like a waste, a loss, a missed opportunity. But the gospel writers 
are quick to tell us that Judas did not care for the poor. Right? He didn't care for the poor. He just cared about what was in the money bag. All he could think of is the percentage he could have stolen from Mary's gift. But what is worse of all, he only assumed. He didn't know what was in her heart, and he didn't know what her purpose was. He only assumed to know. You know, several years ago, that song was written, You Don't Know the Cost of My Oil. And listen, none of us know the cost of each other's worship. We can only assume when we see somebody do something extravagantly. I've been in those kinds of services. When somebody does something so out of character, so out of the ordinary, that it catches all of us off guard, But if we're connected to the Lord and we're in the moment, then we will understand that this worship that they are giving, no matter how extravagant it may look, no matter how inordinate it may look, no matter how off it may sound or or, or strange it might be, we don't know the price of that worship. We don't know the moment of liberty that they have received from the Lord and what chains of bondage they've been set free from. We don't know Mary's personal story, why she's always found at the feet of Jesus. We don't know her brokenness. We don't know her sin. We don't know her background. But Judas assumed all of these things and that he could judge better than the Lord the value of her gift. Let's look at Jesus. Jesus the justifier. I like that word justifier. I like that it's got a cross right in the middle of it too. Jesus our justifier. The manner of her worship, its extravagance, and the cost, and the display, and every other adjective I could use was not wasted on him. He says, let her alone. All three gospels declare it. Let her alone. Now before I dig any deeper, i got to talk to you about the word justifier. We all need an advocate. That's why John says we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. But this word justifier not only carries the connotation of advocate or attorney or someone who would stand in a courtroom and defend our case. Listen, we've all watched shows where the public defender was inept. And the prosecuting attorney for the city was well paid, well dressed, and well trained. And this is our adversary, Satan. And in the courtroom of God's house, Satan tries to Bring down every worshipful act and everything that you and I offer to the Lord. And he tries to discredit it and discolor it like he did when he accused Job. Job does not worship you because he loves you. Job worships you because of the things you give him and the things you do for him. You take all that stuff away and Joseph will not worship you. God says you can take it, just can't touch him. Takes it all. Job still does not sin with his mouth. What does Satan say? Skin for skin. That's nothing. Let me touch him. 
God says, you can touch his flesh, but you can't kill him. And boils rise up on Job's body. And what does he do? He sits down in the sackcloth and ashes. And he scrapes with broken pottery the sores on his body. And he says, naked I came in and naked I go out. But blessed be the name of the Lord. We have a justifier. We have an advocate. We have a defender. We have the ransom, the sacrifice. Jesus is the one defending us. From the criticism of others like Judas or from the criticism of our enemy Satan, Jesus is our defender. And what does Jesus say? What does he say to Judas? What does he say to the others for criticizing the costly offering, the sacrifice that was wasted on them, that was not wasted on Jesus? What does Jesus say? He says, let her alone, yes, but he says two more things. He says, she's done this for my burial, and because she has done this, she will have a memorial. Jesus understood the moment. He said her gift had a purpose, and her gift not only has a present purpose, but it has a lasting reward. For it will be remembered whenever the gospel is preached. Whenever the gospel is preached. The gospel is the good news, right? Wherever the good news of Jesus Christ is preached, this story will be preached. Whenever people talk about the covering of my blood and the forgiveness of that my blood brings. Whenever people talk about my death, my burial, my resurrection, my ascension, my vital intercession, wherever those stories are told, this woman's story will be told along with it. Mary's worship was not only contained in a moment, that moment became a memorial. Have you ever been so captured by worship, so captured in a moment that there was nothing off limits? Right? There's nothing off limits. In my late... 20s, from, from 26 to uh, almost 30, three and a half years, I pastored a little rural church in Tennessee. I, I tell about it all the time. Bone Cave, file number 153. I tell about it all the time. But I saw things there in that group of people who were so humble and so hungry for God that there was nothing off limits. I saw our worship leader. One day he told me, he said, Pastor, there's nothing I won't do for God. He said, if God tells me to go in the back of the church and stand on my head, I'll stand on my head for Jesus. And one night I'm up preaching and I look back at the wall and there he is standing on his head. One of our church and pastor's council members a wonderful southern gentleman, a man of soft-spoken, few words, but deep character and conviction in the service of the Lord. I've got to lay the microphone down if I'm even going to imitate this. like a ballerina, this 68-year-old man. And he's lost in a moment with God. And all of a sudden we realized that a bottle had been broken and that spikenard had been poured out 
and that the very personal treasure that this man had and his personal glory was being sacrificed for the worship of the Lord. And in that moment, it became a memorial, and it has marked my mind, and I think of him often. Although he has gone on to heaven, I think of him often because I can still smell the fragrance of that night. I remember being in a camp meeting when we were pastoring in Iowa. And God said, I want you to go to the altar and I want you to begin to pray. And it wasn't altar time. The man of God was preaching. It wasn't, it wasn't altar call time. And I said, no, God, I, 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 I don't, I don't want to do that. And God says, I want you to go. I want you to go right now. And I want you to intercede for this service. I went. I poured my heart out before the Lord. I prayed and I interceded. And I like to believe in some way I aided the preacher that night. Somehow I was like an Aaron or a her. And I was holding up his arms while he was preaching. Or somehow I helped someone come to find Jesus. But you know what my personal loss was? I lost somebody from my church because they were at that camp meeting. And they said, I've never had a pastor that would go to the altar as much as you do. I think there's sin in your life. I think there's something going on there that you always are in the altar. But I have a justifier. And you have a justifier. And what this whole message has been about, if it's, if it's not been about anything else, it's been about this. What about you? How have you responded to Jesus' gift of salvation? I don't know if I'll put up the rest of the slides. You guys can just hold that one there. I, I may not need them. I feel the Lord in this place. I'm going to ask the team to come. I want somebody in this place to know this is a safe place. I want somebody in this building to know that in days to come, maybe it's not today, but in days to come, if God calls you to the altar, or if God pours out His Spirit on top of you, and you can't contain yourself but dance, That you can do that here. I don't sense a Judas spirit in this place. Because if I did, I'd preach the rest of these verses. And I'd preach the rest of the slides I've got. But I don't sense Judas is in the room. I sense there are other sincere worshipers. I sense that there are other people in this place that if you got up and broke a bottle, somebody else would be breaking a bottle. If you got up to dance, somebody else would get up and dance with you. I'm telling you, because he has saved me, there is nothing off limits that I own. Because he saved me, there's nothing out of bounds I won't do. To show him my love. To give him my worship. Because I'll have another opportunity to give to the poor. But I may not have another opportunity to worship him in this way, in this moment, in this time. I may not ever get this moment again. And because of that, I will worship him. So if you feel that and you can stand to your feet in this building... Father, right now, whatever you do in the next few minutes, it's between you and your children. It's between you and your people. It's between you and you and them and them and you. But may this room be filled 
with the sweet odor of spikenard and of freedom and of liberty and of worship for the one who gave his all. Jesus. However you worship him, whatever you do in the next few moments is between you and him. So I will stay for a little while Until I look like the one I behold And I will pour out my vial Until all of me is on the floor And at your feet I will sit At your feet I will sit Your name is sweet like honey Your voice is sounds like the waters Your eyes are full of fire Fairer than the sun's amid Your name is pure and holy For you alone are worthy And there is none beside you Lord of lords and King of kings So I will stay for a little while Until I look like the one I behold And I will pour out my vial Until all of me is on the floor Fairer than the sons of men. Your name is 
Hallelujah, I believe that God is setting the stage for something wonderful to happen next week. I tell you, I'm looking forward to the kids and the youth being on this platform next week because I know Jesus said that the kingdom has to be released, I mean received, excuse me, has to be received as if you were a little child. And I believe in the songs and the smiles and the worship and the performance that these children are going to bring are going to lighten the heart of God. And He's going to see their worship. And something is going to be released in this room. It's going to bring people to Jesus. It's going to bring people to Jesus. Because, see, that's the lasting memorial of this testimony is it keeps bringing people to Jesus. And I believe these kids, as they worship, and the youth, as they lead us, and even Pastor JR's message, I'm telling you, bring people, invite people that haven't been to church in years compel them to come in even those who have been hurt in church let them know it's not like that anymore it's not like that at North Elliott come see the kids and the youth Come hear a message from God. Come see God do something. Come participate in what God is doing. I believe people are going to be saved next week. I believe people are going to be saved. And in that understanding, not only are we going to be doing all the other things Wednesday night, prepping for people to come, but as we prep and before we leave, we're going to be in this sanctuary and we're going to pray over all that is done next Sunday. And we're going to believe God that people are going to be set free. And that long-standing wounds and hurts are going to be released. And Jesus is going to be glorified. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Let me just bless you, pray over you before we leave. Father God, we recognize 
you in this moment. It's why we feel what we feel and do what we do. Go with us. Let this memorial carry us through this week. Honor the kids as they're practicing with your anointing next Sunday. Honor the youth as they practice Wednesday with your anointing next Sunday. Honor us. Honor our prayers. Honor our efforts with your presence. Save our family. Save our friends. Save our coworkers. Save the people that'll just walk in off the street. Save those who come for a meal. Be lifted high in this place. Be at the center as the song said earlier.